Hi, I'm Corey Nathan, and this is Talking Politics and Religion Without Killing Each Other. Your home for engaging conversations about the topics that matter most in our culture. If you love nuance, if you want to better understand different points of view, if you're tired of the screamers taking all the oxygen out of the room, if you'll enjoy edifying, provocative, and fun conversations among high-profile public figures and regular folks like me, you love talking politics and religion without killing each other. Thanks for spending some time with us. Enjoy today's show. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are What's Next and talking politics and religion without killing each other. Your next favorite political podcast, and I guess your next, next favorite political podcast. (laughs) I'm Corey Nathan, one of your hosts, joined by Emily Matthews, Jessica the Reporter Stone, and Daniel Uh Hare. So, yeah, we're doing something a little different today. You might be hearing us on the What's Next podcast or the Talking Politics and Religion Without Killing Each Other podcast. So if you like one show, please hit that subscribe button, then go find the other program and hit that subscribe button and leave us reviews and comments and all that good stuff. What we're trying to do is build upon a positive ecosystem, recapture some space for sanity and decency in the public square, all of which we'll be talking about today. Emily Matthews, Jessica Stone, Daniel Hare, thank you all for jumping in and being part of the solution. How's everybody doing today? Great. Thanks for having us. Hey, Corey. It's good to it's good to be together. It's good to be together of folks that have some uh, common basic values, right? Um, we're all Mets fans. I mean, that's the most important <laughs> thing, right? <laughs> what? Wait, oh, what? Dear. what? 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 <laughs> <I get it. laughs> we're already um, disagreeing from second three. What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> all right. You know, why, why don't we start by giving a little bit of background and every on everyone, just uh, so each of our audiences can get familiar with you know, our, our, uh, what, what is this called a, when, when Putin and Biden get together, what is it called again? What is it? Uh, a summit summit. Yeah. Our podcast yeah. summit. Thank you. Yeah. Emily, can you tell us yeah. a little bit about yourself, where you're from and your professional experience and all that good stuff? Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm from Atlanta, uh, originally actually from the DC area, but we moved down here when I was a kid. So I definitely consider this home. Um, I always kind of felt the calling to go back to DC, um, you know, get into politics somehow. So crazy enough in the Trump era, I decided to jump in, moved up to DC and spent a couple of years up there. Um, Worked in the kind of never Trump conservative bubble for um, Stand Up Republic, which is founded by uh, Mindy Finn and, and Evan McMullen, and just kind of worked in that space and have continued to do that over the last few years. That's awesome. What about you, Jess? What, what's what's your story? I have no bona fides whatsoever. No, you're crossing the divide as we speak. <laughs> yeah, I am crossing the divide as we speak. Yeah, no, I'm fascinated with having civil conversations because um, unlike some of my lovely uh, colleagues in uh, the media, I don't think yelling is going to get us closer to the solutions we look for. So I'm, I'm really, I'm here because I want to create more of the same kind of space and I'm appreciative of, of, and interested in promoting anyone else who's genuinely looking for answers and, and asking good questions and not yelling at each other and having some civil disagreement. I think it's increasingly important to be able to disagree in our culture and there's not always enough room for that. So as a journalist um, who who does live in Washington, DC, um, I sometimes feel like a fish out of water in that respect, but um, I'm still breathing. See, my gills are flapping. (laughs) (laughs) What about you, Daniel? Yeah, well, first off, I'm crossing off uh, yelling from my list of things to do today. Uh, As Jessica just uh, eliminated that from my repertoire. So yeah, uh, my name is Daniel Hare, and I appreciate the opportunity to be with you all today. Um, I am, uh, I would say, uh, a first and foremost, just a concerned citizen um, looking to find a way to contribute and get involved. Uh, My life is really uh, completely separate from politics. Uh, I have a a wife and three kids, and I run a business and uh, live in Waco, Texas. Um, worked in college athletics for about 10 years, still do a little bit of that work and, and uh, uh, am a licensed lawyer, though I've tried as best I could to never practice. Um, and uh, then uh, I knew there was uh, a reason I liked you, Daniel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the non-practicing lawyers are the best types, right? Um, no. And then 
I, I did get involved in 2015, really through 2015 and 16, or around the election time, especially with uh, no labels, uh, bipartisan organization in Washington uh, as a volunteer, as sort of a contributor, get involved in that. And that's really kind of what got me into the uh, political space the first time and just have paid attention ever since and looked for ways to contribute and, and uh, just uh, uh, appreciative of the opportunity to hop in with Emily to do what's next. And we're having a lot of fun with that um, and excited to be here with you all. Yeah. Yeah, this is great. And just a little bit of background on me. I am uh, personally a Jew from Jersey who became a Christian uh, a number of years ago. Professionally, I have always straddled business and the arts or entertainment um, small business owner, uh, like you, Daniel, did you say wife and three kids? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's me. That's me. In fact, uh, <laughs> our middle one is graduating high school today. Thank goodness. That's exciting. <laughs> um, that's so yeah, just, I've not been directly involved in politics, but it's always, I've always been very engaged. And as I've fallen in love with this podcast medium, I thought it might be a good outlet to have productive conversations, especially, uh, to contribute some conversations and remind folks, uh, starting with me, how to have uh, engaging, edifying conversa conversations with folks that I don't necessarily agree with. We seem to have lost that ability um, as the, the heat is turned up and our anger and our fears and our anxieties are always on edge. Um, I think that finding folks that feel differently about any given issue um, is um, is you know, it's an opportunity to grow and to learn a different different point of view, even if we walk away and still disagree. So that's why we started this, our, the Talking Politics and Religion podcast. So uh, with that in mind, I think the first question, uh, we're, we're going to have topics. We're each going to address um, some big topics, but there's a couple preliminary questions. And Jess, you, you had a preliminary question. You want to get it started? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm also a person of faith and um, I'm always interested because I see politics and religion as ways to connect with people, believe it or not, the two things you're never supposed to talk about at the dinner table, um, <laughs> what, how people's faith uh, shapes or doesn't shape their politics. So I'm putting that question to all of you. Awesome. Well, I'll take a stab at it and uh, see where we go from there. Uh, so, yeah, I grew up in a Christian home, grew up in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, and uh, became a Christian uh, as, as a you know, 10, 11 year old. You know, I, I think probably like a lot of people here in the Bible Belt kind of followed the from the political side, kind of the. Christian Oklahoma thing to do, which is, is everything was Republican and everything was conservative. And, um, you know, and as a high school or college, I wasn't like a super involved, you know, kid at that age or anything like that. But, uh, you know, as I've gotten older and gotten more engaged, um, you know, had a family and, and, and all those things, you know, they have become uh, very intertwined in a lot of ways. And one of the things I think um, that's most on my mind right now, and, and we'll get into it a little bit later in, in, in the topic I want to bring up, but is just, you know, I, how uh, we are as Christians, those of us are Christians, um, to look at politics in the, through the lens of our faith. Um, and, you know, are we, I think, and I think we are, I'm looking at myself in the mirror, susceptible as I, for a long time to thinking they're uh, so intertwined that they are interchangeable and one and the same, and that one necessarily means the other and uh, that kind of thing. So I'd say, especially in the last year, year and a half, it's been a real kind of awakening for me on kind of that front to make sure that I am first and foremost, not ever compromising my faith, my Christian principles for any particular candidate, particular party, particular issue, anything, because um, that's who I am first and foremost. My identity is in Jesus. That's what I believe. Um, nothing else comes close to that. That politics is a temporary part of our home here uh, as humans while we're alive on this earth. Um, and we want to utilize that in the same way we do anything else in our lives as Christians, as missionaries for the gospel to others through our businesses, through our families, through our communities and our politics. And so am I doing that every single day that I'm involved in the public square? And, and I think I can honestly look at myself in the last 15, 20 years and say, no, that I wasn't doing that, that I was just kind of falling in line with whatever was there before. And so that's what, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in uh, right now and, and kind of thinking more about one. We'll talk about it more later, but that's kind of my quick background on that. Cool. 
Yeah. I have something to add to that too, that, I mean, this is, you know, I feel like I completely echo everything that Daniel's saying. I, I very much relate to that. I think something that I really kind of had to learn in 2020 was, you know, I think I had being a Republican and always voting, you know, for Republicans or, you know, independent when it came to the 2016 election, it was so hard for me to bring myself to vote for a Democrat this time around. Um, I ended up voting for Biden. I started a group called Biden Republicans. Um, and I think there were so many voices saying, you know, you're either all for everything that Biden does or you're all for everything that Trump does. And I found myself in such a unique position of, obviously I wasn't gonna be voting for Trump, but I saw that there was such a huge concern for the future of the country and the Republic um, if he were to win, that even though he might you know, push policies through that I agreed with, um, I couldn't bring myself to vote for him. And I really just knew that, you know, this time around, I, I couldn't bring myself to vote for an independent and kind of have my vote go unnoticed. Um, so I think the point I'm making here is that with Biden this time around, and I've spent so much time praying about this um, and just coming to a point of realizing that there's so much grace. And I think there was part of me that thought if I vote for him, God's going to be mad at me. I'm doing the wrong thing. I'm doing the evil thing. Um, when I think as I can best understand the way God was kind of speaking to me, that his understanding that I wasn't voting for Biden because I was, you know, pro-choice. I wasn't. In fact, I've been, you know, pushing, you know, through a Biden Republicans group ways for um, people to now get involved in, in fighting, you know, for the pro-life issue under the Biden presidency and even trying to kind of work with people in, in the administration to do that. Anyways, just kind of understanding that there's more nuance and more grace than I think I realized there was. Um, so that's just been kind of a, a different thing that I've worked through in the last year or two. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. That's definitely a question that right strikes at the core, Jess, as you well know. <laughs> um, so without going into the long version of my uh, testimony. You can go to a previous podcast episode for that yeah, one. You, <laughs> Link, um, link, it's a, link, hyperlink. <laughs> it's like a sitcom that 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 particular episode. Um, so, when I was in my late twenties, I really started drilling down on what my basic existential questions were, and I got it down to two really basic beliefs that were completely verifiable to me, but I couldn't verify to anyone else. Um, and those beliefs are, there is a God and I'm not God, <laughs> you know, they, like just strip it down to its wow. basics. So <laughs> off to a good start there. I like yeah. That. <laughs> so that, but if you, once I arrived at that conclusion, it, it eliminated a lot of other um, belief systems, uh, non-theistic belief systems, um, as well as uh, common worldviews. And then I started really zeroing in on Christianity because some of the questions that I had, um, you know, and there are a lot basic, like I said, existential questions. Who are we? What's wrong with the creation? Um, where is this all headed? You know, what's what's wrong? And these basic questions. And as I finally was able to approach uh, the Gospels and the letters in the New Testament, how the cohesiveness and the coherence of how those questions were answered uh, were revelatory for me um, to the extent that I was willing to, what, what felt at the time um, like a betrayal really of my family and my heritage and the identity of Judaism. Now I've subsequently come to the understanding that I'm, there's nothing that can stop me from being Jewish like that, regardless of whether I believe um, in Jesus as Messiah, which I do, I'm still as much a Jew as I was on the day that I read from the Torah for the first time uh, when I turned 13. But uh, how does that, how does my belief system or my identity as a Christian inform my politics? What I found when I first became a Christian, this was in the, early 2000s. In fact, I became a Christian before, right before, it was probably right before Bush was elected the first time, uh, George W. Bush. W. Mm -hmm. But even then I realized that I, this, we were going to this big Baptist church and I realized a lot of my friends, like I, I was voraciously reading scripture and I was deriving conclusions, philosophical conclusions um, and 
trying to make practical decisions like, well, how do I vote on this initiative here in California? Or which, you know, candidate am I following now? Because everything was up for grabs. And I was just really trying to filter it through the lens of scripture. That was my most direct connection to God. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. And I found that a lot of my buddies were starting with their political or, or their social beliefs, and they were backing scripture into it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For example, I went to a sermon where the scripture was a verse at the top of Leviticus 19, and uh, the pastor was uh, adamantly anti-immigration. <laughs> I mean, like, just not a big fan of anybody that was currently living outside the United States and anybody that was living in the United States that started out otherwise. Um, and he started with this verse at the top of the chapter. And uh, I made the mistake of actually reading the rest of the chapter. <laughs> <laughs> and what I found was at the bottom of the chapter, the scripture was saying the exact opposite of what this dude was preaching about. So that that's just like, you know, it's not to say that scripture is uh, mostly falling on the Democratic side or the Republican side or, you know, it. it Scripture is its own authority, you know, mm -hmm. and I, what I would what I would say is I try earnestly to start with scripture and derive social and political positions from that as as opposed to, no, I'm a Republican or I'm a Trumpian or I'm a Democrat, whatever it might be. It's mm -hmm. scripture first. That's our it's a pretty clear lens. If we take if we take a holistic view of scripture, I don't know if I'm. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I mean, there's a reason why Jesus didn't make political statements. He made personal statements, you know, treat your neighbor, take care of your neighbor, take care of the immigrant, all of that. But he never brought the government into whether the government should be involved or whether it shouldn't. And I think that gives us a lot of freedom to, um, again, just keep that. As, the scripture is the highest authority. Yeah. Didn't he say render unto Caesar what is Caesar's or was that somebody else? Was that No, Paul? that was him. Yeah. That was him. Okay. Yeah. So that's about the extent of his, you know, like follow yeah. the law. I don't know if I necessarily <laughs> yeah. well, agree I mean, with that, but this might, that might be for a whole other podcast. I, yes. <laughs> I know where I know. I have heard your argument. I know where you're going with that. And I didn't hear that until a couple of years ago. And I was like, wait, what? And I'll let you get into that if you want to. Oh, but your tax, you know, like, yeah, I mean, you know, but it, like, it's not in a lawless society. I think exactly. he's just acknowledging that there's, there's not, there's a higher authority meaning yeah. God, but there is an earthly authority and you're not supposed to be like a renegade. Well, what I would say yeah, for is, the most part, although see, Corey's going to find the loop. Here. We might have to do this again, just to talk about this very issue. But <laughs> what I would say is that everything that Jesus said in his earthly ministry and everything that Jesus did, it resonated on so many different levels. Uh, it, everything he said and did had symbolic uh, resonance and impact, and it was meant to have uh, symbolic and, and visceral, you know, when you heard it, um, when you saw it, when you saw what he did, it wasn't just the act itself. It wasn't just the words themselves. You know, he was also, he was, for example, he was often making uh, scriptural references that first century is uh, people in, in that area um, and, and Jews would hear very specifically what he was referring to, you know, that yeah. we might not necessarily pick up on if we haven't you know, thoroughly studied the history of first century Israel. But the, again, like I said, that's uh, so I think he specifically meant to be subversive on so many levels uh, because, you know, the economy, the politics, the religion were all wrapped up into one um, in that time and place. So uh, anyway, I'll shut up. <laughs> Let's talk about our podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Let me have a huge shift here. So just do we get to hear just do we get to hear Jessica's uh, response yeah. to that uh, question? Yes. Um, yes. So I was raised in a Christian, an evangelical Christian home. I was raised by a Jewish convert to evangelical Christianity and a Catholic convert to Christianity uh, to evangelical Christianity, and um, lots of layers of dissonance um, culturally and religiously, and that's what really makes me ask these questions because there's a certain level of discomfort I've had over my lifetime in the culture of Christianity or even in the culture of the sort of the faiths between Judaism and Christianity that try to combine them. And I don't feel completely comfortable, obviously, um, celebrating in the Jewish faith wholeheartedly, although I do so out of respect and tradition and greatly admire the Jewish faith. And I just find that we don't talk about religion enough. Like I said earlier, I 
I think it's a fascinating part of the dialogue that we need to be able to have. And um, it shouldn't have been uh, President George W. Bush that had the first faith based office of, initi- you know, faith based initiatives office. We, we should have had that focus um, a long time ago because our, our country is very much shaped by specific religious ideals and we're continuing to shift towards additional religions and representations that we need to discuss and understand. And how does it shape my politics? Uh, the, it, it shapes the questions I ask. And I would say I'm, I'm wrestling very much like Emily is with some of the same questions Emily is um, that she mentioned, because I do think that even my desire to be impartial has sometimes made me, uh, has been a shield for kind of wrestling with some of the thornier intersection of my religion and my politics. And, and even in a quest to be open-minded, you can, you can be that, but you also have to be true to yourself. So that's uh, a journey and I'm still on it. So it, really interesting. It, it sounds like all four of us share a, a, a desire to live out our faith in all areas of our life. Um, and this, you know, podcasting is, is one expression of it. Obviously how we vote, who we support, what issues we um, get behind um, are all part of it, but it also sounds like, to, you know, like I said, podcasting is is a part of working out our faith, working out our beliefs, um, and how we're engaging with our culture. Um, for the talk of politics and religion audience, Daniel and Emily, could you tell us a little bit about your podcast, why you started it, what you hope to achieve with it? Yeah. Well, you know, we kind of wanted to start something kind of in the vein of what you were saying you guys do with your podcast, which is have people on to have those civil conversations. Um, You know, I think that there's just such a lack of civility in politics right now. Um, Over the years, I've had Democrat friends that I've disagreed with, but we come together, we eat together, we, you know, have community together, um, we share our faith together, and we can have like positive, constructive conversations about politics. But you know, with media being the way it is, with social media just being, you know, you're throwing bombs across the aisle at each other and there's no loving of our neighbors. Um, So we kind of wanted to start that conversation like you guys have done, but also lay out kind of a 10 part strategy for how we kind of reclaim a healthier GOP Um, because that's, you know, where we come from, that's, those are policies that matter to us. But if you're, you know, getting policies passed, but not communicating love or not messaging correctly, it's just going to be useless because you're going to have, you know, people are, hearts and minds aren't going to be changed. Um, So with each episode, we kind of, we break it down. We've had Matt Lewis on to discuss how media um, and conservative media, like conservative measured writing in the David French, Matt Lewis uh, vein is good for that. We've had people come on to talk about grassroots efforts. Um, We had Michael Wood, who was a candidate in Texas, come on to talk about you know, running for local office and working, you know, getting people in that way. Um, So that's kind of been our approach. And then we'll just kind of see what the next season brings. But we wanted to at least start the first season with construction uh, or constructive advice instead of just, you know, oh, this is where it went wrong. We wanted to offer solutions. Yeah. And I would just the one thing I would add to that, um, and I think this has borne out um, over the last couple of months as we've been doing this is, um, you know, recognizing that we And I think Matt Lewis is the one who put it this way, are in the wilderness politically right now. Some have called it that we're orphaned. Um, Others have said, you know, we've been, you know, we didn't leave the party, it left us. However you want to frame it, um, I think we know that, you know, and, and you can put whatever numbers on it. You can look at the polling data and everything else, but that uh, those of us that are engaged in politics that kind of have this conservative, but GOP roots, but not following along with the current trajectory, that's a small group. I mean, um, and they're being ostracized, you know, just kicked, kicked out in every possible place. Um, and that, and that's okay. As Matt Lewis was saying, that's okay. Like we, we know that, but I think one of the parts of the podcast that I appreciate is we wanted to provide a space for those of us that are left to, to <laughs> huddle around and to remnant. like, you know, yeah, the remnant, right. To, to be there, to, uh, you know, uh, be there for one another to kind of think through what are the next steps and knowing that those are going to take years. I mean, it's going to be years, um, not w- days, weeks, or months, years, maybe decades before um, we can kind of move past what we see is the kind of the current infected um, GOP. And so um, that, that, that's a piece that I think is important too. Yeah, for sure. This definitely resonates. Um, what I was seeing, what we're trying to do with talk of politics and religion without killing each other is just that. 
I mean, a <laughs> lot of the observations that that you've just articulated is exactly the problem that we're trying to address. You know, there's multiple um, cable channels. There is just dozens, hundreds of podcasts now that are defined by basically a political form of prejudice. You know, you, you turn on the most prominent voices and the opening monologues are, you know, a description of, you know, what the left thinks or what the Republicans are trying to do or, you know, describing these these large groups of people that they're labeling a certain way um, and and saying what they're thinking and what they're trying to do. Um, and it's really gross generalizations and mischaracterizations, you know, and, and then that begins, it feeds our collective consciousness. Um, so it either defines how we're engaging with each other, whether it's online or in person, it suffocates those voices that really want to explore the truth, you know, explore nuance. Mm -hmm. So I was encouraged to see over the last couple of years, a little bit of pushback against that, you know, and it starts, I think it starts small with the ones that I, I often refer to the dispatch and the bulwark um, and the politicology now and um, Mike Madrid's uh, Americanada. There's a growing ecosystem that uh, I wanted to contribute something to, even if it's just a fraction of a fraction, you know, it's, um, 100 people or 500 people or 1,000 people who are spending an hour or so um, listening to folks whose point of view they might not have heard otherwise, um, and especially listening to folks having conversations in ways that isn't, it, 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 it doesn't belong on Sean Hannity's show or, or Will Cow's show. Um, you know, that's, that's not their, their brand. Uh, so, you know, our endeavor, especially with these two big issues, politics and religion, politics and faith, um, we, we just want to take some of that space back in the in the public square. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll see where it goes. If, if we can um, persuade one person in California 25, that's uh, one 333rd of the way there to uh, take back <laughs> democracy. <laughs> so. Uh, anyway, this so is an area awesome. where Corey is not in the gray area. <laughs> <laughs> the I'm nuance not. is not in that. yet still full of grace. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. No, we definitely all have very similar missions and it's nice well, to find other people in that space. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, I'd love to hear Jessica talk a little about her, Jessica, your role in the show and everything. I do want to talk to the audience for what's next. That's listening on that feed right now that, when we're done here, please do go over and subscribe and listen um, to Corey and Jessica on their show. And, and we'll put all the links below um, because I, I do think it, as we've, as, as I was talking earlier about having a place for people of our uh, persuasion to go, um, there aren't that many of us and there aren't that many shows for us. And so, yeah. um, and what they're doing is really great work and I think will be of great value to you. So please do that. All right, Jessica. Well, <laughs> I think one thing that has to be said is that it's, it's not, it, it's only, it's hard to talk about your faith when you are uh, a journalist. And there's a lot of us who either don't talk about it because we don't have it or who don't feel like we can talk about it um, because it's going to brand us in a certain political stripe where we can't be um, objective uh, about different issues. And look, I think the important thing that I've realized and that I want my colleagues to realize is that we all have biases, but we should be able to talk about it civilly. And I'm just so struck um, through my work around the, the world and all of the things that I've learned through my international reporting experience, uh, uh, that so many of the skills it takes to do that around the world are so needed at home, especially after what we've seen in 2021 and, and the end of the election cycle last year. Um, and, and the people that should be leading that charge, I really think are probably people of faith because uh, mm -hmm. people of faith believe that we're accountable to someone higher than us and that we should have our behaviors moderated by that belief and we should subscribe to the greater good. Well, that's not happening in our country. Um, it, it's not really happening in, um, in, in mosques or temples or churches. And we're just as divided in those places 
Um, and I mean, my pastor was talking this week about unity and it wasn't like Joe Biden's unity speech. It was unity within the church and our church specifically. And I'm just very taken by the idea of what does that take? It really takes knowing each other and listening to each other. It takes sitting down and breaking bread with each other mm -hmm. and acknowledging that we don't all have a lock on everything. We can have very strong beliefs. We can have a very strong identity, particularly if we're followers of Jesus in that identity, but that doesn't look like exactly the same for everybody. That doesn't mean truth is fungible. It just means that our ways of living out that truth aren't identical because we aren't identical. Um, and I just, I, I would like us to be able to have that discussion of nuance without throwing barbs at each other and painting each other into a corner. And I, I'm struck by how much more difficult that is now than it was when I began in this profession. And yet how much it's a part of what got me into this profession is this discovery of truth and, 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 and revealing of truth and the belief that if truth is revealed, it will make people more capable of making wise decisions for their lives and their country. So we've got to get back to that. And this is a wonderful opportunity to be part of what I think is a really thoughtful genuine desire to get to that. So thank you, Corey, for allowing me to be part of your world on this podcast. Sure I love thing. it. Well, I've been reading over the last couple of days, there is uh, in Israel, there is an Orthodox uh, Jewish politician who is a hardliner when it comes to Palestine and a secular Jewish politician who's a two state solution. And they couldn't be more different on certain issues, but they're realizing that the foundations of their democracy are at risk if they don't find common ground, which they did. Um, and I, it may be happening as we speak, as we're recording this, uh, but they're forming a coalition government uh, that doesn't, you know, that Bibi Netanyahu is uh, maybe no longer going to be the prime minister. Uh, we'll see. Mm -hmm. I think it's at around midnight. Um, well, so we'll see. But listen, if they could figure it out, we could figure it out. <laughs> you know, like yeah. Yeah, right, right, I mean, right. I might, I might not be a big green new dealer, but like, I don't know. I feel like I could be in the room. We could find common ground on something. <laughs> you yeah. know. Yeah, it's, so. yeah, I completely agree. And I gotta say, as a nod to that bipartisan, or at least just the way things have changed. Like Jessica was saying, I actually worked for um, one of my first jobs in D.C. We was working for Secretary Rumsfeld. And he was working on a book about <laughs> Rummy. There are some stories there, Emily. <laughs> we are going to be getting coffee. <laughs> He's hilarious. I gotta be careful because I'm being recorded. Like, I, yeah. I, no, no, but I, I saw him at a charity event because I yeah. did a lot of work with the military. And for all of the the meet the impression I had for him through the media, oh my gosh, the guy's hysterical and yeah. like normal. And like you don't get any of that from the way that he was written about. Yeah, I mean, you know, he was working on a book about uh, when I first started working there, he was finishing it up that year. And so I had the privilege of getting to like read through it and kind of help with like just the basic editing process, not, you know, the publishing stuff. But it, it's a fabulous book. It's called When the Center Held. Um, and I don't know if this part got cut or not, but he tells a story about, you know, Ford was his, you know, he worked for four different presidents for four different administrations, but President Ford was the first that he had been friends with in Congress before they became president. And he just had a ton of admiration for him. But for the, you know, he tells a story about the eve of the 1976 election, I guess, between Ford and Carter. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. They, you know, they went out, they campaigned, they were, you know, everybody was just as much headstrong in what they were doing. And then they all ended up at a Georgetown party on like the eve of the election and broke bread together, you know, and it was just such a different era. I mean, can you imagine if Hillary and Trump, you know, went and, had a you know little happy hour in Georgetown right before the election or Biden and Trump. I mean, it's just like such a different era um, and just something that. I want to see the squad and Josh Hawley in the same room oh, yeah. with Ted Cruz and see if they can agree on wine or beer, like totally yeah. like, you know, come on, you got to be able to agree on something. Be an adult. Or favorite you know? foods, macaroni yeah. and cheese. Do, we, yeah. do you all like macaroni and cheese? <laughs> yeah. Well, the rest of the country does it. That's the thing. Yeah. You know, people yeah. do it. It's just in D.C. It's like it's a whole different game. But that's because they're not breaking macaroni and cheese together. That's I exactly. Always it. come back to that. It's the mac and cheese factor. 
Definitely. I do think there's there's room for uh, politicians like Tim Ryan, who's running now for Senate uh, in Ohio, mm-hmm. um, you know, in the House as a Democrat currently. Um, and, you know, the fellow that you used to work you, or that, Evan Lindenmeyer. Is that who you used to work for? Uh, Evan McMullen. McMullen. Mm-hmm. OK, so it's, I worked for him after Rumsfeld. Yeah. OK. All right. Yeah. So, I mean, there's plenty of room for that or um, gosh, what's his name? He has uh, c- country first. Um, Matthew Dowd. Uh, not not Matt Dowd. Oh. Matt Dowd is involved, but who's the yeah. the, the congressman? Adam from Kinzinger. Kinzinger. Oh, thank oh, you. oh, yeah. I was. Thinking I mean, I could totally party. see Kinzinger yeah. and Tim Ryan hanging out, or or yeah. um, Spanberger hanging out with with uh, Justin Amash. Like, I, yeah. I do think there's something there. I mean, for for goodness sake, we had Governor Kasich and uh, Meg Whitman and Colin Powell speaking at the DNC. I mean, these are these are yeah. classical conservatives. You know, they're not Trumpian conservatives, obviously, but I don't think Trumpian and conservative belong in the same sentence. So that's why I've been against them from the start. Yeah. yeah. Part of it is just extricating the poison that infests some of these conversations. But Emily. Yeah. You we had a we'll get to topics. Each of us will be able to present a topic and discuss it. And why don't we just kick that off? Emily, you you had uh, something interesting. Okay, Um, so I'll just kick us off with the first topic, which is kind of moving the GOP forward. Um, You know, I think, obviously, we've talked about this a lot in our podcast, uh, What's Next? It's really been, of course, the whole theme, um, you know, and something that, you know, Daniel and I had a pretty good laugh on last week's episode with Tim Miller, because we kind of opened it up saying, you know, Daniel and I and some others, probably just a handful of people, thought that if there was a good, you know big enough repudiation of Trump um, in the 2020 election, that there would be a wake-up call to the GOP, that there would be, okay, electorally we lost. This is not a winning strategy to you know hitch our rides to Trump, and let's start kind of purging the party of these extremists. Um, and it seems like the opposite happened. You know, January 6th happened. Um, Marjorie Taylor Greene just like blew up, you know, Gates and just all of those jokers. Um, and so Tim, of course, made the joke that, you know, he was right the whole time and we were wrong and, you know, he was right. Yeah. Um, so we had a good laugh about that, but it's true. And I think, you know, it does leave me feeling bewildered, um, you know, again, which is why I started the Biden Republicans group was because I just was like, this needs to happen so that the GOP can then move forward and, and heal. So. I am a little bit more cynical than I used to be, but, you know, we've talked about the different strategies and and kind of something that Liz Cheney has touched on is, is it, you know, a lot of questions, is it going to be a top down thing? Is it going to be a bottom up thing? And I think she really hit the nail on the head when she said that it's going to be a lot of small wars or small battles in a larger war. And I totally agree. Like, I think it's going to have to be kind of a holistic approach that we take, you know, whether like in our different strategies that we discuss, people are going to have to get involved on the local level, you know, we're going to have to get new candidates in that can slowly rise. We have to get, you know, good media out there so that people aren't, you know, the oxygen isn't getting sucked up by the extremes from the mainstream media or or from MSNBC and Fox, you know, that we're Mm -hmm. opening up conversations like these. I think this is important so that people can say, oh, okay, I'm allowed to have a nuanced thought on this. Um, you know, I think it's just going to be a lot of small battles that are fought, you know, on the electoral level um, that will eventually kind of get us to the point of maybe reclaiming the conservative movement, but it's going to take years. Um, I don't think it's going to be an easy fix. Um, so that's kind of my take on that. Uh, you know, and I have another question too, but I want to open it up first to kind of see what you guys think. One of the things that strikes me, actually, and I know you didn't anticipate me jumping in as the journalist, but um, (laughs) this quickly, is that there's just a lack of pragmatism in a lot of in the party ideology on both sides. And in 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 the GOP camp, I feel like there are elements of pragmatism in and the people who kind of support Trump, not because of the white supremacy or the nationalism, but because of the idea that. Um, there are people that have been forgotten in this country economically. Mm -hmm. So could we put that in a bucket? Could we put um, the traditional values voters, um, maybe especially I'm thinking of like the people along the Texas border in a bucket that despite maybe not liking the rhetoric around Mexicans still voted for him because they want law and order um, 
could we put together um, people that are concerned about these traditional values with people that uh, maybe don't think that corporate welfare is a good idea and that we should have like a huge corporate tax cuts and that there could be higher taxes, but that we should also take care of the environment. Like there's, we just have no choices between mania and, and, and it's even hard for me as a reporter to watch what, what's become of the Republican party. I can't even recognize, like, I don't, I don't understand and, or know personally too many people that are in that, you know, that, that think that, that didn't hold their nose and vote for Trump if they voted for him, you know, um, and, and are true believers. It's, it's astonishing to me that that still exists. So I, I wonder if, what, if anything, for you guys uh, is could move the GOP forward in a, in a way that could grab more um, people that have gone to the Democrats um, mm-hmm. because they can't, they don't find any common sense in the Republican party of today. So being from California, I have some thoughts on this. <laughs> um, in the late eighties and early nineties, the Republican party of California took some pretty extreme stances uh, in particular on immigration, just as, as one example. And because they insisted upon the most extreme version of a stance on a particular issue, they rendered themselves essentially irrelevant over the last two and a half, three decades here in California. Now, I happen to live in a a California senatorial district where we do have one of the few effective Republican elected officials, Scott Wilk. I'm a huge fan of his. One of the things that he's doing differently than what you'll see at the national level is He understands his constituency and does his best to represent his constituency while still maintaining his conservative values. And that's reflected on his staff. That's reflected on how he engages with his loyal opposition in the California State Senate. Um, You know, his staff, like I just in fact, I just heard from Chris Huff today, his chief of staff, who happens to be a Democrat. (laughs) You know, like (laughs) he, he specifically wants to have. Um, a staff that has diverse points of view so he can hear it, it doesn't mean that all of a sudden he's going to be, um, you know, a, a spendthrift, uh, fiscally speaking. Um, it mm. doesn't mean he's going to leave his principles at the at the door. Uh, he can still be who he is, socially and fiscally conservative, but also understand how to work collaboratively with folks that are to his left. Now, I see at the federal level folks going the way that California's Republican Party went uh, in the early 90s. It's either embrace the big lie, um, embrace the Marjorie Taylor Greens and the, you know, Matt Gates over Liz Cheney, or, you know, you, you risk being in the political desert. Uh, so I think there's a possibility that this version of the Republican Party is going to render themselves moot at every level. Um, I hope that's not the case because we need tr- real conservatives having a say in in big important legislation. But um, it seems that you know uh, t- Tim Miller was talking about this. Uh, you know this argument has been had, and Donald Trump won, unfortunately. So you know I hope that's not the case. Uh, I don't know what the prescription is necessarily. If that means that there needs to be a third party for homeless folks, you know, for, for the Meg Whitman and Christine Todd Whitman's of the world. But that's, I do see a lot of parallels as they say, history maybe doesn't repeat itself, but it certainly rhymes. It rhymes and that, that's yeah. what I'm seeing right now. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think, you know, something that Jessica mentioned, you know, you talked about the the pragmatism around some of the different issue buckets and the types of voters, things like that. And when I think about the success that President Trump had in 2016 and really in 2020 and the number of voters that he turned out. You mentioned the Texas border. That was certainly a surprise. Um, and, and, and I do think that some of the things like communication towards those who have felt left behind economically, particularly white, rural, middle class, uh, especially, but then with law and order around minority communities that have issues with crime and drugs and things like that did resonate. Yeah. And it seems and it, and it does seem like if he if Trump had run 
um, in either of the two elections on a traditional conservative Republican platform with fiscal, you know, we're going to reform Social Security and kind of big corporate, you know, business stuff and that, those types of things. I don't think he would have had near the success that he had um, doing what he did. So um, I, I do think what we're seeing, and, and, and Matt Lewis talked about this on our show the other day, is it seems like, especially on the argument of fiscal policy, that there isn't a fiscal conservative and fiscal liberalism anymore, that it's just sort of a, it's, it's who the money's going to. Um, it, it's going out from the government and it's who it's yeah. going to. Yeah. Um, and so whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know. I mean, as a long time conservative, it's like, oh man, I don't know. How am I, am I comfortable with this like idea? We're just never going to reform any of these programs that are clearly uh, in long-term uh, you know, poor health, um, you know, or we're just going to continue to print more money and, and, and that, I mean, it's popular. Of course, it's popular. Everybody likes to get <laughs> the checks in the mail. Um, and so I understand why it polls well and people are happy when they get it. But then at some point, at some point, I know everyone keeps saying that uh, everybody keeps kicking the ears out as to when it is that whether Social Security or, you know, the uh, government in general, you know, has trouble with debt or paying back loans and or going bankrupt. But, you know, it, I think that's a key part of the success of of what Trump and, and now those that are following him did in, in the last two elections. And so I think it's hard to kind of try to reclaim that because they have that. And so if you try yeah. to go back in with the traditional conservatism of fiscal policy, there's no market for that right now. Mm -hmm. um, and even more so if you go in not willing to continue the you know election uh, fraud stuff and all that uh, election was stolen stuff and, and kind of even, you know, not kind of kiss the ring of Mar-a-Lago, then you're, you know, you're kind of already on the outs and, and, it, and you just, there's nowhere to go. And so I, it's interesting to try to figure out, yeah, where, where that path is. Um, and that's where I think we get into short to medium term, call it the next like one to four presidential cycles, like whether that is just trying to create, you know, kind of a fulcrum in the middle, uh, whether that's either as independents or with the Democratic Party or with a group in particular areas, you know, Republican uh, Party as well, potentially, if it's in a more, you know, if it's in a city that's sort of a swingy city uh, district, maybe you can kind of get those people back into a, uh, you know, a, a GOP type deal. But um, for for the party itself, it just seems like it, it's, it's, it's gone for the medium term <laughs> uh, to Trump and whatever follows him. Well, I just remember being in the RNC press shop uh, when they announced the autopsy from after Mitt oh, Romney yeah. lost the 2012 yeah, presidential yeah. election. And they concluded that they needed to do more, not less outreach to Hispanic Americans in particular. Um, and obviously Trump flouted that thoroughly and proved that you don't need that constituency if you can, you know, turn out the, the left behind white supremacist voters, basically, um, <laughs> or nationalist voters, at, to put it uh, maybe a little bit more moderately. I'm still fascinated by the question of what the GOP would look like if it if it did follow those recommendations. Do you guys have any uh, thoughts? Yeah, it would look like Paul Ryan. <laughs> Except you know? he caved with Trump. Yeah. Like he, he ran on principles that he then completely caved on when it came to um, the health care vote uh, under under President Trump. Like. Like yeah, I, I stick with your principles and then, you know, then I can respect you as a, as a politician. But once you fold and you go completely against, um, you know, being a budget hawk after you've been a budget hawk your whole career, I'm sorry. Yeah. Done. <laughs> I, I don't, I can't necessarily blame him because number one, Trump won. Uh, he was president. And number two, you know, he, he had a very, very, and Boehner too, had a very, very difficult job keeping that whole coalition together. He had uh what was uh Jordan and, um, Freedom Caucus. Yeah, yeah. I'm totally so, blanking right now. Meta, no. Yeah, Meta, yeah, Mark, Mark Meadows. Meadows. Yeah, Thank yeah. You. yeah. So no, yeah, Jordan like... and and Mark Meadows. He had that caucus to that that were basically a complete wrench in the entire system, and he had to placate those guys every now and then. They wanted to, you know, throw their weight around whenever they could. Uh, okay, but I want to just real... go back to this question, and I'm sorry to interrupt because I really do. I'm really curious, and I, and I think you've talked about it with a little bit with me of. Of the, the main thrust to me of that autopsy was widen the tent and widen it in a different direction for the GOP than Trump did. Yeah, because Trump won. I think that's the answer. Trump won. And so they just went with it. As well, well. But, but I think we're going back further. Right? Long we're term, saying, it's we're, not a yeah. long term strategy to 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 widen the tent the way Trump did. Because 
Yeah, I mean, I think because those voters are not young voters. That that autopsy came out in 2013, and Trump didn't really make his move until 2015. So, and, and there was there wasn't any movement on executing on that autopsy from 2013 to 2015. Trump didn't right. end. I mean, he, he ended it with a like exclamation point, but it was already yeah. in the trash, right? I mean, so to Jessica's point, like. Um, that, that there was never any follow up. I mean, that thing, I, Corey, I was laughing because when she was saying that, you kind of had this notebook, it, people watching video um, uh, that you pulled across. I'm like, oh, there's the autopsy. We pulled it out of the trash can <laughs> that it, they threw it in as soon as they printed it. Um, and uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, th they didn't follow that at, at all. I mean, it got laughed out of the room uh, basically once it got published. And, and I, um, so, and then, yeah, I mean, Trump was the exclamation point that ended it, but um, I, I don't know why. It, yeah. And, and whether it would have looked different, would we have, you know, because now there's a race right between the Republicans and the Democrats to what to to get more people to vote. Right. The, the argument being that we should lower the 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 barriers to being able to go to vote. And that's about including more people in the process. Well, mm -hmm. if you're going to include more people in the process, you should probably be messaging to those people. And I don't know that the that that Trump's GOP is doing that. No, no. I, I mean, I, I would agree with that. And I think, you know, I think the answer is that, you know, they really are just looking for short term. You know, I mean, the politicians that are in there are like, OK, when's the next race? Am I going to be safe? Then I'll like I'll follow the trends. You had like Elise Stefanik, who was one of the like the value or the principled. Republican. Oh, boy. Talk about change. <laughs> um, who totally just became, you know, crazy to get ahead. Um, and uh, sadly, that's how Washington a lot of times works. I'm with you, though, as far as long term solutions. And I think, you know, I don't know if you guys listen to the um, the remnant, but they're putting out a new series called The Hangover, which is kind of going into like more of the autopsy report now. And it's funny mm. from this last election, but it's funny. I remember, I forget the host who's doing this. Um, but it, he made the joke that, you know, if we're still not acknowledging that Trump lost, if Republicans are still not going to just admit yeah. that you can't even have an autopsy report, you know, right. because right. they were right. They won anyways. So why look at it? You know, it's just all fraud. So it is going to be interesting to see if they are able to learn anything from their loss, their huge losses, really from the 2020 election. I think a solution in terms of like long-term reconciliation or long-term changes. And again, this is like probably way too pragmatic, but making those inroads just the way, you know, Democrats luckily this time around picked the most moderate. I mean, I wouldn't say Biden is moderate, but he's the most moderate candidate that was around in the primaries. And thank God, you know, they wised up and they realized we, we aren't going to go down the same road that Republicans did with Trump. Um, but I think like they were so smart. I mean, I was so proud of the Democrats that I knew that were like running this stuff because having Christine Todd Whitman, having, you know, Kasich at the DNC pulled people like me over mm -hmm. for this. And I think Republicans could do a similar thing, you know, working on just common sense, you know, as far as environmental action, that there's a conservative way to approach this. I know Benji Backer has a great organization called, I think it's American Conservative Coalition, ACC, um, that it brings in a lot of like conservative values to, you know, climate change issues and, and conservation and just having more groups like that elevated um, to message more to maybe younger generations that don't want to go far, far left, um, but are completely turned off by the Trumpy GOP the way we have it now. And that might be more of a long term solution, because you're right, it is older voters um, that became, you know, super Trumpy, and it's not going to be around forever. And the, and the newer voters are, are more progressive on social values. They're browner, they're blacker, they're more diverse. Mm -hmm. And and the GOP completely goes, you know, it, it, it gets dead and buried with a you know, big old stake through it if it doesn't appeal to those new voters. Yeah. You can't keep we, getting the Fox News viewership and call it, you know, an election. It's not going to work. No, we don't have a future conservative movement if we don't learn how to message to those voters. Jess, was that your topic or were you uh, picking up on on the original? No, topic? I was I was riffing. Um, I don't, let's see, what was my topic? Well, I mean, I, the segue I could make is this. Um, you guys were you guys have interviewed Tim Miller, as you talked about, and you've interviewed um, Bill Crystal. Um, and they had a lot of prescriptions. Uh, I had a couple of questions about the uh, idea of a straddler, which is what Bill Crystal thinks that the GOP needs in 2024. Somebody who sort of gives lip service to uh, some of Trump's base, but is not 
in his pocket. And I'm wondering who we should be watching. Um, and then, and Tim Miller conversely talks about, you know, hey, why don't we have a never Trumper run as a Democrat, which mm-hmm. I don't know how that helps the GOP exactly. And I'm not sure if that's what he wants to have happen, but it doesn't sound like a solution for the GOP. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I think to start with that one, I think where Tim is going is that um, he is looking, at least in the short term, to, you know, beat back the Trumpy GOP, wherever that is, and however you have to do to beat it. And so, you know, if that means that for the foreseeable future, then there, there needs to be, um, and I think where he's going with that is talking specifically about um, maybe a, a, a middle to red district um, congressional race type thing. We're not talking necessarily Senate or president or whatever, but like kind of a congressional races, like looking, okay, is this a, is this a district that maybe is like, you know, 55, 45 Republican in the last election that if you can swing that, you know, 5%, maybe that went down the Trump road over, you pull that mm-hmm. in with, you run a never Trump person, but the Democrats are never going to win with a traditional Democrat in that district. Yeah. You run a more conservative, like never Trump Republican that could beat back the Trumpy Republican. I think that's where he's going there. And in certain districts that might make sense. Um, he talked, I think, briefly, too, about what, does Liz Cheney have a better chance now uh, of running as an independent um, and uh, foregoing the Republican primary where, I mean, the Republican primaries are where, you know, this purging is really happening uh, of mm-hmm. kind of the non-Trumpy candidates. And so, um, you know, and then I think uh, I'll let Emily talk more about kind of Bill Crystal's uh, recommendations or thoughts. But I think where we're going there is looking at people that you know, maybe haven't uh, haven't necessarily had to vote and, you know, for, you know, or, or I say vote against impeachment, vote against, um, you know, the establishment of the 1-6 commission, maybe governors, DeSantis comes to mind, uh, but people that have still kind of adopted that, maybe a little bit of that tone, a little bit of that fighting spirit that everybody seems to like in Trump um, and, and kind of not uh, taking on the culture type war things. And, um, but yet, they, so he can, but he can also has some bona fides of, of where he's had success in his state um, and hasn't had to take all these votes that Democrats can hang on him as they would maybe a Senator or a Congressman or woman from this past year. So I, I think those are kind of some of the things that, that I took away from those conversations. Emily, what else did you take? There's just not that many people who haven't had to take a position on Trump. He's not somebody that makes people look warm. So it's, it's got to be a right. pretty small group, right, Emily? <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I'm trying to, th- honestly, Bill Crystal was our first episode, so I'm trying to jog my memory. He did offer so many solutions. I think one of the most useful things that, you know, the Republican Accountability Project is doing, which Bill Crystal, you know, heads him and Sarah Longwell, um, is being able to just be this, like, point where people can donate to and just have a ton of money in the bank to protect people like Liz Cheney, to protect those kinds of races, which again, you need a lot of money to, to Hmm. keep your seats. And I think that that's a really effective way, just like targeting, um, you know, those races and protecting them because we need those people in there. I think just playing defense in that sense, like, again, it's going to take, you know, there are (laughs) <laughs> like what Lincoln Project did in the 2020 election, there are aggressive takes, there's, you know, there's that side of it. And then there's the defensive side and the grassroots, you know, efforts. Um, it really takes it all. But I'm really glad that they're, they're stepping up to really protect the ones that we want to keep, um, not just tearing down, you know, what we don't want. Yeah, and I, I, just one follow I'm sorry, just real quick, one follow up to that. Speaking of uh, protecting the um, candidates in the primaries, I, I was struck, I mean, this is just an example, but you know, after the vote in the House on the 1-6 Commission, I'm from Oklahoma originally, and there was a back and forth over the last two, three cycles in Oklahoma 5, which is the Oklahoma City uh, Congressional District. It went Democrat for the first time in a long time in the 2018 cycle, but it was like 50.5 to 49.5. Kendra Horn took it, um, and then it went back in the 2020 cycle to Stephanie uh, Bice, um, the Republican, uh, by about a similar margin. It was really close. Um, and she's been with I think Trump all the way, very conservative, but voted uh, in favor, was one of the ones that voted in favor of establishing the 1-6 commission. 
I mean, and, and to see my Twitter feed and, and posting, okay, these like targets on their names for primary, like it's on, mm. um, it's just striking. I mean, like the, the, that's, I mean, you take one step out of line and um, I mean, never, I don't, didn't vote for impeachment, didn't vote for impeachment, um, you know, has been with him all the way on policies and, um, wow. you know, vote for that one yeah. six commission and is on the target list for all the groups, you know, that you would, you would think of as, as that get involved in that. So to Emily's point and to the Republican Accountability Project is, yeah, pooling together funds to protect um, people. I guess now she's in the list that you got to protect, even though probably wasn't before. But um, it's crazy. You guys are making me realize how blue my state is. <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> we don't have any examples of like that in Northern Virginia. <laughs> yeah. I love the Republican Accountability Project. In fact, I hope that there's a lot of PACs that are looking at the democracy report card, the, the GOP democracy report card. I just yeah. did a quick one. Uh, I'm no political scientist. I'm not, you know, a strategist, but I took a look at that report card and I found that there were a dozen, a dozen Republicans who got a D or an F that won their district by less than 5%. Oh, you know, wow. I looked at it partly because my R representative won by one tenth, less than one tenth of 1%. Um, and yet he got a D minus on that. The only thing that he, um, that he did that showed some courage and some integrity was that he didn't sign on to that stupid amicus brief uh, back in December, the Texas AG's thing. Um, <laughs> get I, I hope that. that they add to that. They keep a, a, a record of it and add to it. You know, how did they vote on the commission? Because I think somebody should get credit uh, if they yeah. voted in and favor that, of the bipartisan commission. That was basically the exact language that the Republicans wrote on, on uh, I think it was January 12th or 13th. It was the yeah. same, essentially the same bill that came out. <laughs> Yeah, Elizabeth Newman. Uh, I know she, you ha you talked with her um, as well and as we did, and and she specifically said that it's a score that can be improved upon, and um, you know uh, it can decrease and increase over time. So as there are more things that you know uh, that happen that require votes or require speeches or whatever. Uh, can I say this too? I was going to say just real quick. What's more DC than a report card? I mean, these are all the nerds in one place. Like, what's <laughs> going to motivate them more than an actual letter next to their name? Yeah. so yeah. funny <laughs> daniel you had a you had a pretty juicy topic <laughs> yeah so one of the, and i referenced it at the top of the show but um one of the things that i've been on the one hand interested in um and and just observing and then on the other hand honestly um living through it and grieving over it and just trying to sort through my emotions and feelings and thoughts about it all has just been how close of a tie-in um, that the, especially the evangelical Christian community has had with President Trump and, and everything that he's done and everything that follows with him in, in the last five years. And, uh, and, and how that, you know, plays through the churches. Jessica, you were talking about that before about, um, and, and, and that's caused, I mean, you know, and I think some of it has been the pandemic in the last year, the um, racial unrest and, and as well after George Floyd. I think um, as I've surveyed and watched churches and pastors talk um, in front of their congregations as well as on social media, I have no trouble believing it's been a probably the most challenging year many of them have had in their lives as pastors of churches. But it's just been interesting to me that, you know, when we started 2015 primary season, you know, I feel like there was definitely a an initial response to Trump from Christians was not my guy. That's not my thing. Um, I'll go Ted Cruz. I'll go Marco Rubio. I'll go pick your other um, Republican candidate in a large field that we had at the start of 2015 to 2016. And I think all the way through the primary, really, up and until uh, he took the nomination. And then I think at that point, um, everybody kind of fell in line. And it, to some level, um, you know, I, I don't think at that point, you know, look, once he's the guy and once he, you know, whatever, I, I mean, um, everybody was then having to kind of go through that process. Okay, I, I know I didn't support him. I was a Cruz guy. I was a Rubio guy or whatever. And, and then when you get to it, it's just really two choices or maybe a third once Evan uh, jumped in and put his name in the hat to give people a place to go with their vote. You know, uh, there was a lot of wrestling with it. I think amongst m almost all of my circle of Christian friends, family, a lot of wrestling with it. Um, and I think there was a lot of grace there on which way that you went, um, you know, with your vote and everything. And then as time has gone on, 
Um, it seems like most of, and the polls, I think, reflect this, the votes reflect this, that most of the Christian community really rallied around and has tightened around him. And, um, and I would say even probably more so uh, repelling against what is projected as the left and the threat that the left presents more so probably than anything else. And um, to the point where, you know, 2020, every, the evangelical community was in lockstep, highest percentages of votes for him and, and you know, is anyone else. It's, just, it's amazing. And then even after post-election to 1-6 and then 1-6 happened, January 6 happened. Um, and, 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 you know, you sit there and you watch as, you know, there are Jesus flags flying over the grounds of the Capitol and worship music playing um, as they're erecting an, uh, a guillotine or whatever they're erecting there to hang uh, Mike Pence. And, and, and I mean, and not that those were exactly the same people, not the point, but it's, you know, um, to continue to watch that and continue to just go along because it's part of the greater good, I suppose, of, of beating what's happening on the other side. You know, uh, it's just been really challenging to me, hard to watch. Like I'm quite, I have, I feel fortunate in that I, I, I don't question my faith at all. I don't question who God is, who Jesus is in my life. I don't question any of that. I'm so thankful for my parents for instilling that in me at a young age and for just the mm. mentors and people I've had all my life. But I could easily see in another scenario, looking around going, why am I part of this? Is this, where, where's God? Where's Jesus in this? Is this what, this doesn't make sense. But I just don't feel like that's being asked. I feel like it, it, it's not being considered at all. Then you throw kind of on top of it, the adoption, it seems, of, of the Q conspiracy theories, which seems very uh, heavy percentage wise among evangelical communities. Um, but you look at the polling for that, it's just, it's, 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 those conspiracy theories are through there. You know, just the automatic sort of just rejection of any talk around race, um, that we can't have those conversations because we're just all of a sudden part of the, you know, woke BLM who's trying to destroy schools with <laughs> CRT or whatever else. You know, so it's just, there's just, I'm just so disappointed and troubled by what I see amongst and i'll just kind of just generally describe it as the you know really white evangelical christian community and and what i'm seeing there i just wonder what your all's thoughts are on all this um and, and what you see moving forward i mean what's what's happening <laughs> i just i'm so confused <laughs> elizabeth newman has a lot to say about this about what's been she happening does. going back to the seeker friendly movement of the mid 90s mid to late 90s yeah and I do think that it's um, it's sad, but it's true that someone who cheers on insurrectionists is given sucker and support in, in a lot of our churches, whereas someone who might have voted for a Democrat once is just not given any space. You're, you're going to be forced out. I can tell you, you know, the two biggest uh, evangelical institutions here, one's a school, a private school, and one's a, a big, a big church. Yeah, you can't you you can't sit in a Bible study and say something along the lines of you know I think Obamacare is closer to the spirit of the, what we're studying here. Um, if I'm going to draw a political you know conclusion from what we're studying, um, not that it's perfect or anything, but I can see you can't you can't say that no, you're going to get gosh, kicked out no, of that yeah. Bible study. You're going to get kicked out. Whereas if somebody sits there and says, you know, those guys were right. They were praying. Did you hear them praying? They were praying. They were claiming the name of Jesus. I'm for Jesus, you know? Yeah. Um, so, but I don't think this is anything new. I think that, you know, the Bible, the Bible is, is, is a, is a long story and it's a story that's still being written, I think, but it has chapters, many chapters uh, throughout the Hebrew Bible um, and to a certain degree, even into the new Testament of when, when the Israelites or the people of God went astray, right? And a lot of times we look at those stories and we think that, you know, um, the, the golden calf or something like that was an incident that was so 180 degrees off of what the practices and the praxis of the people of God should have been. But in reality, a lot of times when the Israelites were led astray, it was five degrees off. They were they were, uh, it was a form of worship that they were very familiar with and looked a lot like what God had uh, prescribed, mm -hmm. uh, but they were led just, just a bit astray. And I think if we look at American evangelicalism, 
there are things that look and feel like they're Christian-y, um, but it's, it's, it's led astray. Like I said before, you know, at the end of the day, um, there are folks who start with their political preferences and back scripture into it, as opposed to sometimes coming to a difficult conclusion of like, oh man, I've been voting this way the whole time. And I'm, I'm now I'm reckoning with this, uh, this part of scripture and it says something very different. So, yeah, yeah. I, I just think it, it requires discernment, uh, a willingness to continue to course correct. Um, I think you, you at one point, Jessica said tacking, hmm. that's just what it requires. So for me, I'm actually, um, because I live in a blue area and our churches have to straddle that line, I would argue I, the church that we've settled on actually is is largely apolitical, um, which is really helpful. But there's, I guess, I, I, I'm just astonished that it happened. Like, I didn't see that coming. I didn't, to me, QAnon was like, I can't imagine believing in that. <laughs> just it's it's nonsensical it's like you know believing in 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 more than ufos i mean at least those the government tracks you know this is it's just completely nuts and remember we had that pizzagate shooting so we already had seen how crazy it was and and um in dc not far from the white house so there had already been you know a, a hail of bullets because of this nonsense so i just mm -hmm. don't i didn't realize that this was happening in churches and that this was not just happening in very rural, uneducated populations, that this was happening in just very ideologically influenceable and vulnerable and culture, more culturally driven than faithfully driven populations of people. And it's, there's some shame there for me because like, I don't write off evangelicals because I have so many police people that are close to me that are, and you could describe my faith as an evangelical faith. Although I would never, I don't overuse that word because it's, it's not uh, something that most people understand to be a rational thinking person. Um, <laughs> right. So I, yeah, I'm just find myself and I'm fascinated by the idea that now we have the same effort in the Christian communities in this country that we essentially had in mosques to excise ourselves of a cancer that grew right under our noses. And that was actually aided and abetted by a movement that, that initially the desire there was more converts, not more empty heads in, in to fill the pews. Right. <laughs> you know? So I'm, uh, cause I, my church experience was very influenced by seeker sensitive, uh, philosophies and sort of make the idea that you should make Sunday more accessible and topically driven and, um, not overdo the hellfire and brimstone so that people are shut down before they walk in the door. I, I'm receptive to that, but I'm not receptive to the idea that these, that belief and faith is culture because I experienced early enough in my life, the, the, the differentiation and, and the divorce there when um, culture became more important in my, my first church that I was a part of as a kid than faith. I, I should clarify and say, I don't think what I was saying before, I don't think it's every church. I think it's particular churches. So I just want to make sure that clarification is made. And if you're watching the trajectory, it doesn't have, you, you you mentioned white evangelical, you know, so churches that are predominantly white and evangelical, I think you could describe some of these symptoms, uh, but there are plenty of churches and I, I still consider myself an evangelist. I don't want to cede that um, philosophy identity lens to those who are primarily a socio-political movement uh, that have just maybe hijacked some of our church communities. So mm. I still I identify as an evangelical, even though that term um, is, uh, is fraught. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, to that, I would just add that I'm thankful that I haven't, you know, I think churches that I've been involved with um, that like hasn't even remotely been in the culture of, of churches that I've gone to. And I'm thankful for that. Um, granted, there are other issues that can arise in churches that I've gone to. I, I, left my home church this last year because it was getting a little too woke. Um, you know, not that we shouldn't be addressing social justice issues. I just think that, you know, from the pulpit, I just want to hear the God every week and, and leave it at that and let there be grace in that. And then we can discuss the other things outside of it. Um, so no church is perfect for sure. Um, but I definitely, like you, was very shocked. I, I think 
I just even, you know, in DC, when I started working um, at Stand Up Republic, even I was like, wait, QAnon explain? Like I was still out of the loop, even though I was in these political circles. So it took me a little while um, to get there. So I definitely had a different experience with that. Um, and I think what Daniel was saying, you know, when he hit on the fact that, you know, it didn't shatter his faith. I mean, it's just more proof that we're fallen people. Um, it doesn't, you know, that doesn't affect me, but it is really disappointing. And I think my friend uh, Ben Howe wrote a book. I, I think we talked about this last time we spoke, but the immoral majority, which really kind of unpacks, you know, it has a really good perspective of how we came to this moment. I think a lot of us were shocked about how we came to this moment, but when you look back, it, it starts to make a little bit more sense. You know, you've got the moral majority um, and, you know, calling out the Clinton administration and, and Clinton for the Lewinsky scandal um, and saying there needs to be a higher moral conscience in, in politics and then <laughs> making all these excuses for Trump, not holding anyone accountable, because if we can use him as our tool to, you know, get the policies we want, you know, really that it was kind of more about political power in the end. Um, yeah. And just sort of how we got to that point. It certainly is disappointing and it is uh, exhausting sometimes to explain that I'm not that kind of a Christian, you know, but you don't have the Christian witness to be hurt um, in the long run. That's what's so appalling. I mean, we you talked about the co-opting of even the symbols of Christianity and, yeah. and we brought that mm -hmm. up with Elizabeth in our yeah. episode with her. Um, how offensive to people that think differently to be represented by that symbol by somebody mm -hmm. with whom they have nothing in common. Yep. That's why scripture is pretty key. Keep on reading scripture. And uh, <laughs> it's pretty stark, you know, uh, sometimes preach it, just, it, brother Nathan, it just doesn't lie there. I mean, it just amazes me just literally like it can open up to any page of the Bible and it testifies against the character and words and actions of Donald freaking Trump. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it, as I'm a Christian to this in my own party, it, it, you know, that, you know, it's because of Christ that I had issues. Um, so I am going to abstain courteously on bringing up my topic. Anybody know the reference, by the way, abstain courteously, Jess, no, <laughs> 1776 abstain courteously. Okay. Yeah. I'm an old guy. I wasn't I, around I, back then. I, I got the wig. I, I got the wig to prove it. Um, <laughs> um, so I will abstain courteously from doing my topic because I feel like we really covered it and I feel like I probably talked too much already, but <laughs> I will. Um, I just really thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I feel like uh, we've found a lot of common ground. I am very curious about what's next for what's next. <laughs> 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 no, I feel like I've made some new friends here. And uh, yeah, I look forward to a bright future for your program and, and your contributions to the culture. Um, Daniel Hare, Emily, how can we find you? How can we find what's next? Yeah, so uh, you can obviously listen to What's Next in any podcast uh, provider that you use. Uh, we would love to have you listen. Um, if you're one of our uh, listeners listening on our feed, thank you so much for doing so um, and continue to do that. We'll uh, obviously uh, ask you all, uh, Corey and Jessica, to tell us about yours too here in just a minute. And then uh, Emily, what we're on Twitter, what's underscore next underscore pod? Yep. Um, right. You can find us on Twitter and uh, that's we'll release new episode information there, clips and, and all that fun stuff. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, and the feeling is mutual. It's been so great to join you guys and find more people in the family. <laughs> yeah. So Aww. what about you all? Yeah. Tell us about you, for, for, especially for people listening on our feed right now. Tell us about where, where they can find you all and connect with you. Jess, how do we find you first? And then I'll talk about the show and the uh, and the Corey, Corey one. Yeah, so I'm at Jessica Stone TV on Twitter. Um, Jessica Stone, I think, dot 1960 on Facebook, um, on LinkedIn, a bunch. Um, I'm really creating a, trying to create a conversation around um, common, finding common ground cross-culturally because I've just written a book about that called Crossing the Divide, 20 Lessons to Help You Thrive in Cross-Cultural Environments. And so we're getting into those kinds of conversations sometimes on LinkedIn and also on my website, jessica-stone.com. Right on. And we'll have the link to your book in, in our notes as well for those. And all those, yeah, places. Well, yeah, awesome. All of it. Yeah. Our podcast is T P and R. So T P A N D R pod. T P and R pod. Um, that's on, on Twitter. And I'm at Corey S. Nathan, C-O-R-E-Y-S 
N-A-T-H-A-N, Corey S. Nathan. And uh, yeah, this is just a real treat. I really appreciate the time. Yeah. We've enjoyed it. Thank you, guys. Thank you for joining us today. If you appreciate what you heard here, please go to iTunes or anywhere you get your podcasts. Give us a five-star rating and leave a review. That really helps move us up the chart so others can find out what we're up to here. For Ronnie Nathan, I'm Corey Nathan, and we've been talking politics and religion without killing each other. We'll be back in a few days to do our little part in Tikkun Olam.